Welcome to another dimension, a dimension of understanding. You are entering a place where reality collides with truth. There are no limits, there are no boundaries. This is our planet radio. Welcome to Off Planet Radio Live. I'm Randy Moggins. It is Wednesday night. Oh gosh, the date. What is it? Ah, yes, January 23rd, 2013 AD, somewhere in time. And uh, got a great show lined up for tonight. My guest is Jerry Lane, The Adventure of Being Human, The Arantia Revelation. We're going to talk about the book of Arantia. A subject that I have never talked about. I did Christian radio for seven years, and uh, I've been doing paranormal, conspiracy theory, music, radio type radio for about four years, and somehow or another, this never came up, and that's a shame. We're going to talk about the uh, origins of the book of Urantia, the Urantia book, and um, this book, The Adventure of Being Human, is what I guess we would call an update to the book on a book of your hands. Um, welcome to Off Planet Radio Live. If I didn't say that before, it's c -c -c cold here in the east. I hope it's warmer where you are. And uh, just want, just want to remind you: check the schedules on the web pages offplanetradio.com, offplanetradio.net. Next week, Crystal Clark will be here, Drowning in Absurdity, Sanctioned Realities. We're going to talk about a lot of interesting things, and that will be coming up next week. I want to bring my guest on. Uh, I want to welcome to the program, Jerry Lane. Jerry, welcome to Off Planet Radio. Well, thank you. Glad to be here. Good to have you on tonight. Um, before we begin, um, go ahead and give out your website of reference. I have it, and I was a little unsure if you had a website um, for yourself, but we're um, basically looking at evolving-souls.org, is that correct? Yeah, that's the uh, website where um, you can find this uh, uh, adventure of being human. It talks about a lot. There's always about a dozen different categories there we, we talk about. Uh, and a lot of it's, as you say, it's attached to the uh, Urantia book. So, let's begin with giving us a little bit of your background, Jerry, uh, who you are, how you came to be doing what you're doing today. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, I've always been interested in kind of, you know, religious, philosophical, metaphysical things. And, uh, oh, about 45 years ago, I guess I'm giving away my age, <laughs> but my <laughs> my early 70s, I'll say. I ran into um, somebody recommended something called the Urantia book, and uh, your listeners can just imagine somebody hands you. I finally found one in a bookstore, and it it's like uh, picking up a, a, the complete works of Shakespeare. There's a large blue book, uh, over 2,000 pages, 196 chapters. So this is a very large book. And when I opened it up and started reading in it, uh, it was almost like picking up a, a foreign language, a new language. It was just so comprehensive, and so all of a sudden you're getting hit with hundreds and hundreds of new concepts. So it kind of stands all by itself, and uh, it took me a while to get into it. And then after a while, all of a sudden you realize it's self-validating. Uh, it doesn't need too much reference to anything else, because... It's so comprehensive, and it sticks together so well that it's just a marvel in and of itself. And so um, after reading it and then uh, putting it aside, I found out there were, all over the world, there were Urantia study groups. And um, there's like, no, it's not a religion, it's not a cult, as some folks think. But uh, right here in the Bay Area, I uh, found one of these study groups. And so getting... Um, was with that study. That was about 15 years ago. I found a uh, study group here in Marin, and about a dozen of us would get together and talk about the Arantia book and realize there's these study groups all over the world. 
The book's been translated, I think, into 12 languages now, and there's probably tens of millions of copies out around. So pretty much, um, let me give your uh, listeners another website. It's called UB, in other words, your rancher book, ubwebsites.com. And you got to realize, uh, years ago when I first started, it was very rare you would ever run into someone who <laughs> who had encountered it, you know, like much like yourself. Now this ubwebsites.com has 300 uh, links all over the world, uh, 28 different categories. So your readers can go there and just <laughs> look around. I think there's even a section there that tries to refute and uh, just debunk the your rancher books, so everything's included. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, after after being in this um, uh, study group for a couple of years, we heard about that all of a sudden in study groups all over the world, people were getting new information. I guess you'd call it channeling. We call it transmitting and receiving, pretty much the same I thing. I like that. I actually like that term better. Okay, so we're it's transmitting. The, the celestial beings are transmitting. We're receiving. And so we had uh, a girl by the name of Donna D'Angelo. She has her own website, uh, you know, Donna uh, Center for Christ Consciousness. So Donna comes off from St. Louis and comes to our meeting, and she starts uh, transmitting, uh, again, celestial beings who are pretty much tied to the Arantia book. Now, I want your listeners to know that 99% of this is in straight English. That's their purpose, is to spread the word. So there's, it's not some kind of really complicated metaphysics you have to get into. And then after uh, being part of Donna's group for a number of years, uh, she was finally leaving, and she wanted someone to take over her part. You know, the funny thing about it, Randy, all along she's been telling us that, hey, anybody can do this. <laughs> anybody can sit down go into a kind of, you know, meditation and start transmitting celestial beings. And, of course, uh, none of us believed her, except all of a sudden here's Dawn is going, and uh, I kind of decided to take over from her. And so about eight years ago, I started doing this transmitting, receiving. And uh, as I, you can go on, and when you on that uh, website of ours, Evolving Souls, uh, it will refer you to a couple other, there's two or three websites that have uh, approximately 300 or so of these lessons and with, you know, students, questions and answers. So here it is eight years later, <laughs> and uh, we're finally getting out a book. You know, the venture of being human is uh, just about some of these, these early sessions and the questions and answers. And so that's, uh, in short, that's how I got into it. Now, you you did this book in conjunction with um, Byron Belitsos, is that correct? Yes, uh-huh. Yeah, I want to point out to the listeners, too, because I'm not at all averse to doing this. Um, Byron just did a great interview with Heinrich Palmgen over at Red Ice Radio. Highly recommend that you go listen to that. That's a, that's a two-hour interview. We're going to kind of cover some of the same territory tonight, too, Jerry. But... Uh, this book um, came to my attention late last year, and it came at an odd time. In fact, uh, I told your publicist when she originally sent me the material, I said, I want to talk to Jerry, because oddly enough, I had just started digging into Rancha uh, in earnest. I've had this book on my shelf for a number of years and never really got into it too deep. I did what a lot of people did. I tried to read this book linear. <laughs> and what, what I discovered was it went better once I began to um, kind of skim and scam, pick different subjects and go through it. And so I'm kind of a novice uh, reader of uh, the Urantia book right now. But if it's my understanding that the work that is being done now in a lot of ways is updating the original book. Yes, it's, uh, what it is is that the um, the Rancho book, uh, again, again, for your listeners, for the newcomers to it, there's there's a 65-page index of these. I'd like say there's 190-some chapters to it, but every chapter has an outline. So if you're interested in philosophy, you can, go, you can go into that. If you're interested in, shall we say, how stars and planets are formed, you can go into that if you want to go tune into how the life carriers actually started life on this planet 
as, as you know, the last uh, several hundred pages are the life and times of Jesus. And so this is, um, I would say, about five times more detailed than the New Testament about the life and times of Jesus. I mean, this is where, this is, um, you know, say like on August 5th, uh, 15 A.D., this is where he was, this is who was there, this is what was said. That kind of detail about the life of Jesus. And so, uh, you know, Randy, I used to think of it as, as um, I have some friends that, again, like you, they might have only skipped around in it, and they thought a bunch of bored college professors got together and wrote this thing some summer. And it's only by when you get into it and you begin to really feel the enormity of this book and the way it all, I've never found a mistake in it, the way it all hangs together, the way all these different philosophy and psychology, religion, uh, geology, uh, the history of the human race, all these things tie together, you begin to credit that what the book claims is that it's written by extra human sources. So <laughs> that slowly sinks in that this impossibility that you've stumbled on, this, this book, actually might be true. But that's something that every individual has to, you know, just come and grapple with themselves. What is the history and background? I understand this book actually goes back in terms of its um, beginnings to the 1930s. Yes. Uh, again, I'll, I'll uh, call your and your re readers' attention to this website uh, called uh, TM Archives, teachingmissionarchives.com. And there it has the whole history uh, in, a, in a fairly um, condensed uh, way. The history of the Arantia book is that roughly in the 1930s, a group of psychologists around the University of Chicago you would get together every year. And there's a Dr. Sadler who had this, uh, he was a psychiatrist, and he had a hobby of debunking all kinds of spiritualist phenomena. He even worked with, like, the police and with the FBI. And he just loved to do this. You know, uh, if somebody would say, well, I'll put you in contact with your dead uncle, and he'll say where the gold was buried. He announced to this large group that he'd run across someone who all of a sudden was uh, this amazing. He couldn't describe this work, and so he asked about 10 or 12 people to form a, uh, what's called a contact commission to take this material in. In those days, it was like type it up, mineograph it, hand it out to these 500, the whole group, and everybody would read it. And that's slowly how the Urantia book came into being. But aside from the material that I uh, transmitted, received, uh, the Urantia book itself was not, was not channeled. It was actually, as it says, it was all written by extra-human personalities like archangels and Melchizedeks and so forth. So that's how the book slowly came into existence. Um, it was pretty well done by the end of the 1930s, 1940s, early 40s. It took about 15 years in 1955 to actually, you know, work up the plates and actually come out with the first printing of it. And like I say, it's 2,000 pages of fairly small writing. So we're talking about an enormous, enormous work here. That's that's roughly its history. Now, one of the things that I thought was interesting, and Byron mentioned this in his interview, this book was actually held back until the end of World War II. Do you know anything about that? Uh, no, I don't, except that, uh, uh, except that, well, World War II pretty well, just because it was what it was, pretty well, uh, took everybody's energies and, and attention and all that. It wasn't until the end of the war that they could actually form a Urantia Foundation and in those days actually uh, come up with these plates, you know, these actually metal yeah, plates. Yeah, with which engraved, to, right. Yeah, and with, with which to actually Old uh, print printing. the book. Yeah. yeah. And the reason I ask that um, is because I find it very interesting, the timelines on things. This book is coming out parallel to the time that Edgar Casey was working, and its emergence in this period after World War II also seems to coincide with the release, uh, well, the discovery of the Nag Hammadi manuscripts and the Dead Sea Scrolls. It, right. it has felt to me for a long time in studying 
what I'll call extra biblical, meaning outside the the canon of what's been accepted as scripture in in the uh, Hebrew Christian traditions, that something was emerging, something was shifting in terms of humanity, and that all of a sudden we have this onslaught of not only the material coming from Edgar Cayce um, and several other people who we would consider to be um, channels, I guess. I, I don't like the term channeling, but I understand that that's a convenient term. Um, what was the, you call it a transmission, is that correct? Well, we call it transmitting and receiving, <clears throat> yeah. where uh, celestial personalities, I mean, actual beings, are transmitting this stuff, and we're just receiving it. And that, uh, that's, yeah, that's just a term we give it. And uh, it's something that I, I spent a number, like, say, uh, four years with Donna, this Donna D'Angelo, who would, who would do this stuff. And you, you kind of sink into it, Randy. It, it's, it takes, someone asked me one time when I gave a, a, one of these sessions here, one of the students asked, well, how can I believe any of this? You know, it's all pretty fantastic. And Michael, uh, this being that I transmitted, he said, well, you can't write off the bat. Your own honesty with yourself won't let you just accept anything. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You just have to listen to it, take it in, and entertain it, and then just, just uh, let it sink in. So at, at, at that time, uh, the only thing I would mention in this respect is that the Urantia book, the, the celestial beings who wanted to bring out the Urantia book, made a petition to even higher, uh, higher authority back in the uh, time of the Renaissance. So it was several hundred years, in a sense, for the permission for the Rancho book to come through. And, of course, to line up all of these celestial personalities, there's about 30 different kinds of beings who wrote the Rancho book. It's, you know, just to get them all together and come out with this book. And, of course, the fact that you in the Rancho book now you're getting the, the viewpoint of humanity from all these different points of view, like a Melchizedek, archangels, some are known, you know, in, in, uh, by way of the Bible. Uh, other things like life carriers, the, the beings who actually started life on the planet, wrote those chapters of the Urantia book. So this is, this is what it's claiming to be. This book actually gives us an expanded, I call it a cosmology, because it maps out I guess the creation from what's called the central universe out into I guess the and again you're right uh, you, this whole your answer thing has its own language we have a, a, a central universe and then we have emanating from that creations that spin out into universes multiverses however you want to describe that is that is that a fair way of characterizing it uh, yes um there is a central universe, and uh, there is a kind of a paradise uh, uh, that they described as a 300-dimensional reality. That if we were suddenly there, we wouldn't perceive anything. We haven't we haven't evolved yet enough. But there is a Trinity. There is a Godhead of God the Father and, and the Eternal Son, the Infinite Spirit. But what it says is that God's primary nature. Now, this is the nature of deity, right? Mm -hmm. Is sharing, and so. God does not actually, it's not the pantheistic idea that God does everything. It's the exact opposite. Is God creates personal beings of all kinds of orders. They go out into what we call time, they come out into time and space here and literally create galaxies and, and nebula and all. In other words, the whole physical universe was not directly created by God, but created by beings that he created. In other words, he's sharing his creativity with the whole order of beings, and we're at the very bottom of that. <laughs> we're, we're the lowest personal beings with endowed with this creativity. And so this is how God shares his essence of this enormous power of creativity. He shares it with the whole order of personal beings of which we are part. And so the whole physical universe that we're in was actually created by subordinate beings. Uh, and, of course, they have fantastic names like... Uh, 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 primary space, uh, eventuated, you know, master creators and things. Another a personal being comes out from paradise and starts a spiral nebula that will, in turn, in time, give way to maybe 50 million suns and so forth. So that's the origin of our what we call the universe. 
it's all actually created and then organized and managed. You read the Urantia book and it actually gives you a table of organization of all of these spiritual beings who are administering <laughs> the time and space realms, you know, galaxies and so forth. So there's a whole, along with the physical universe, there's a whole, whole hierarchy of spiritual beings, creative spiritual beings who are administering everything. And I guess that kind of brings us into the first level of this that I wanted to go into with you, Jerry. And that is the um, the satanic rebellion. Uh, what happened? What went horribly wrong? First off, it, it is my understanding that Earth, or Urantia, which is the name given in the book to Earth, we call it Earth, and it isn't really all that far off, um, but there was something that went horribly wrong and there was a great rebellion that occurred on the archangelic level is that correct not exactly um, there is uh, uh, let me back up just a little bit is that uh, God creates what you call we would call um, creator a, son, a creator son and a creator daughter in other words uh, what we roughly like a male and female deity to us mm -hmm. they come out into space and part of our galaxy they call it the local universe it's, uh, right now our local our own local universe has uh, close to four million inhabited planets so we're talking about an enormous cosmology here so michael and mother spirit are these two beings who are head of a local universe a local universe has a hundred constellations. That, that's another group. Each constellation has a hundred local systems. And each local system will eventually have about a thousand planets. So this, this is the enormity. Now, down on the local, local uh, system, our local system here, it's that lower being who rebelled. Uh, they call him Lucifer. And it's the head of our little local system, about 600 planets. It's that much, much lower being who rebelled. And then the our own planet, Urantia, actually joined the rebellion. So uh, com uh, compared to Michael, shall we say, the head of four million planets, uh, uh, this uh, Lucifer was only, is only the head of about 600 and so. So when he rebelled against Michael and against God, against the order of things, 37 planets, you know, including ours, went out in this rebellion. So, in one way, the rebellion is, is only like 120th of a local system, which is only, you know, a very small part of the local universe. So, the rebellion is not, from that point of view, is not all that large. But, unfortunately, 200,000 years ago, our planet joined that rebellion. And so, a whole orderly... Um, celestial kind of way of evolving a planet it all fell apart <laughs> and it went back into chaos so for 200,000 years now we've deviated from a, a normal course of planetary evolution and we're like we're still at war I mean that's supposed to be long long ago we're supposed to have evolved out of having warfare and things but right now uh, because of this Lucifer rebellion uh, our planet is still you might say very very backwards Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So Lucifer and Satan are not the same being. This is something that I've gone back and forth with. My background is evangelical Christianity. I was raised right. in it, and I was schooled in it. And um, because the accepted scriptures, I believe that they've been uh, just gutted in terms of detail, they don't give us a, 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 a clear picture of what happened, who the players are, where in the scheme of things relative to Earth was um, Lucifer stationed and relative to Earth, Satan? Okay, um, again, Earth, Urantia, is one of 600 planets in our local system. Our local system is only one of, of 100 of, a, of, a, of a, what you call a constellation, and that's only one of 100 of, of the local universe. So we're in, a, we're in a little local system here, just at this local part, you might say, of, of uh, different planets and things. Mm -hmm. And Lucifer, uh, they call him a Londondedek sun. That's just an order of being. 
So he and Satan were on the system headquarters when they de when they declared this rebellion. And on our planet here, uh, we had a uh, another kind of being. Uh, it's called a planet. They call him a planetary prince, and that was it was a celestial being here on the planet. His name is Kalagastya, or they say they say this is who you call the devil. Yes, it was right here on our planet. Was the head of our planet, uh, the celestial family of our planet here, joined the rebellion. So Lucifer and Satan were on the system headquarters, and our own planetary prince, you know, the head of our planet here, joined the rebellion and threw everything into chaos. Everything had been proceeding very nicely up to that point. But from that point on, that was 200,000 years ago, that rebellion. That's what threw everything into chaos, and that's why our world, in a sense, really almost stopped evolving in a spiritual sense and we've had nothing but you know 200,000 years of incessant warfare you know culminating in the second world war where you know millions of people died so this according to the rancher book and, and uh, what i'm involved in this is just now starting to turn around what was humanity like 200,000 years ago um the in 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 the rancher book it kind of breaks down in pretty deep detail the formation of life on this planet from almost microbial level moving on up. So at 200,000 years ago, what was humanity like? At that point, we had emerged as a race. Is that correct? Uh, way, 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 way back. Again, we're, we're into your Rancho book kinds of... of <laughs> Relativity here. Sure. The first, the first, the first human beings. Uh, the first, the first beings on the planet here who evolved to where all of a sudden they had the presence of God within them. This, this is the Rancho book. They define a human being. We're a creature because we were created by God of free will, dignity. In other words, a million years ago, this actually a brother and a sister evolved to the point where all of a sudden they get, they get became a certain self they had a certain self awareness mm -hmm. a certain this awareness and this creativity gave them a free will which no animal has and at that moment uh, we believe that there's a small speck of God a presence of God in every human being for the first time in planetary history this presence of God came into their minds right and, and started evolving things so the first human beings were almost a million years ago. For five hundred thousand years, very little evolved. I mean, they would find, they would discover fire and then lose it. They were, these are really, really primitive people, right? Five hundred thousand years ago, the planetary prince comes. Uh, at the same time, the human race splits off into uh, six different races, which are still somewhat prevalent today. Mm -hmm. And so, for three hundred thousand years human beings were actually taught and brought along in terms of animal husbandry and agriculture and weaving and all these arts these very very super primitive beings are brought along and then 200,000 years ago uh, we would call it a, about the tribal stage now where they had fairly consistent you know, tribal kind of things they had the early arts they were starting to form the earliest forms of government and a social structure and things so when this 200,000 years ago when this big uh, rebellion occurred and everything was thrown into chaos almost all that almost all of that social and, and evolution fell all apart now people are, they continue to evolve physically you know slowly uh, we're much more brighter and, and so forth than then but in terms of social and political development, we're still very primitive. Um, there's a there's a statement in the Urantia book by a high angel that as long as the males uh, show they continue to dominate the females, we're still considered to be very primitive. So, some of the cultures on our world, which they do that, are still considered, uh, in this sense, very primitive. Does the Urantia book address? Uh, for instance, the great flood uh, that we would call the flood of Noah, does it go into what happened in that particular period, t to your knowledge, Jerry? Uh, yes, it, it, uh, it, it more or less uh, says it never happened. Okay. 
there, there was there was a Noah, by the way. There was an amazing human being. He's mentioned and given a little bit of his life uh, in in the Arantia book, but there never was a great flood as such. That's very interesting. Yeah, the, this is the thing about the Arantia book. It really flies in the face of a lot of established belief structures, in, including... Uh, Christianity, the Hebrew religion, and also the New Age religion as well, you don't espouse to a reincarnation theory as well. Is that correct? Uh, yes and no. By the way, this is one of the... Uh, I say I transmit... Uh, I receive Michael and Mother Spirit. They're the creator son and the creator daughter yes. of our local universe here. And this is nothing so exceptional. Any anybody can do this if you just learn a technique, you might say. That uh, what was that question again? Excuse me. Gosh, I think we both forgot it. <laughs> right, there's so much here. It's, it's, I'm, I'm I'm always shy by just saying too much because it's so deep and it goes in every direction. Well, I think the questions basically were that. Well, okay, reincarnation. That was my question. Oh, there we okay, go. Excuse me, reincarnation. Um, you know, yeah, I, I said that that's been asked a lot, and they've taught Michael and Mother Spirit have taught a lot on this. That there is much in the reincarnate. There is much in the whole theory of reincarnation that is true. Physically, right? Mm -hmm. We we uh, gather. Uh, in other words, by when on, on conception. We have our parents, our great grandparents. We have the whole biological history of, of, of evolution, right? Right. So, in that sense, reincarnation is true. Also, by the time you say we might be, we, by the time we're ten years old, we have absorbed the whole history of the culture into which we're born. That's language, that's beliefs, that's everything, right? The right, whole culture. Right. Yeah. So, in that sense, uh, we we inherit all of this. The only thing they say is we have no previous existence. And that's when a sperm, as the way Michael put it, when a sperm and an egg comes together, that is a unique event. You can look at a bunch of uh, a, a pictures, shall we say, of a dozen brothers and sisters, the old-time uh, pictures. Mm -hmm. Every single one has a distinct face and a personality. So when an egg and a sperm get together, at that moment, God, a personality doesn't have to come from anywhere out from paradise or have to be pre-existent at that instant God creates a personality to associate with that physicalness and you've only got to wiggle your fingers to see how intimate this association is right mm -hmm, mm -hmm. in other words that's when we start that's when our essence our personal uniqueness starts at that moment but then it goes on in other words after we die here, it goes, the Arantia book goes into chapter after chapter, detail after detail, what happens to us after we die, about the kind of world we find ourselves on, uh, everything about that, and so we keep going through phase after phase after phase forever, we keep growing, we keep getting a huge soul of experience on thousands of worlds, although we have to cross the whole universe before we even come to paradise. But it starts here. And so they're saying uh, the normal notions of reincarnation, there's so much truth in them, right? Right. There's, right. So, there's so much that people, in, in the sense it is true, it simply starts here. We have no previous existence. And so in one way we're free. We're not determined by some kind of previous existence. It's just that by the time we reach, in, oh, shall we say, teenagers and we, we reach an age of choice, we're already such a complex being, biologically, culturally, physically, mentally, all of that, that that's how these notions of reincarnation came about, you know, hundreds of years ago. Okay. And the reason I ask that is because it, it, it is a contrast. It's a difficult concept to wrap your head around. As I understand the way it's been explained and the way that it's mapped out in the Arantia book, this is this is level one of an existence that's that's largely eternal. It's like a spiraling um, upward, I guess, almost like ascension type thing. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. We're 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 listed as um, um, we're an ascendant being. Um, again, here's the thing of of this. Uh, they say we have an ultimate choice that. 
eternal life is not folks, uh, forced on anyone, it, but it, we're, we're at the beginning stage, so, <coughs> excuse me, a human being cannot literally choose to cease to exist. We, we could kill ourselves, but we're still going to awaken on the next world. But Michael just gave a couple lessons on, um, because of the shooting in Sandy Hook, and, and yeah. an individual with almost no soul, no no human contact, right, that even enabled him to do that sort of thing, that when he reawakens, that is in his soul now, that, that, that what he did, and that might be so painful for him that he would say, please God, let me, just let me cease to exist. And along those lines, uh, Randy, the... Um, Lucifer and Satan, a lot of those high spiritual beings who caused this whole mess uh, a couple hundred thousand years ago, they no longer exist. And there is, they would never accept the fact of what they did and the kind of pain and suffering they've caused. And so at a certain point, they cease to exist. And there was eternal life is not absolute in that sense. It's still a matter of our choice. Our, our freedom of will is that great. Okay, let me back you up on that point now, because it's my understanding, based on my reading of the Arantia book and what I've been able to glean from some of the discussions that go on online, is that the the rebellion was brought before a court and it was adjudicated, and that this is a it, in terms of our linear time now that this was fairly recently adjudicated uh, 1985 1986 okay so in the course of that adjudication a decision was handed down is it my understanding that the archangel Gabriel was basically bringing the charges before the court yes uh, 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 yes uh Gabriel actually is, is higher than an archangel. He was, uh, when Michael and Mother Spirit came out here into time and space and got, got everything started, he was their firstborn son. Okay, okay. So he's the highest, yeah, he's the highest being next to them, right. And he brought, yeah, he brought the, Michael refused to judge his own son. In other words, Lucifer is the son of Michael and Mother Spirit. He was, he was their son, and, and so, uh, yeah, Gabriel brought the charges. 200,000 years ago. In other words, the, <laughs> these courts work in, our, in terms of our, our time very slowly. So, upon the verdict being rendered, what was the process that then occurred that resulted in um, these rebellious beings no longer in existence? Okay, when the rebellion broke out, for a number of years, I, I'm not sure exactly now, I forget, I think for about five years celestial time, maybe for about 50 years of our time, the, the rebellion was allowed to run full. I mean, every every personal being in, in the higher realms, like in the local system, was given, you know, was given this time to choose one side or the other. And after a certain amount of time, the higher beings from the constellation, they just stepped in and squashed it. They could have done this at any time. Mm -hmm. But they let it run on for a while, let everybody choose, and then they step in, just squashed it, and Lucifer and all these um, all these enemy angel uh, higher beings were taken into custody, literally taken into custody, and they were offered all all of these rebe all these rebellion rebellious spirits were offered. Michael offered them uh, his rehabilitation and his forgiveness and stuff. But clear to the end, there's a number of of these celestial beings who refuse any kind of rehabilitation and so Randy from from this point of view they they themselves cease to exist in other words there is a, a God's plan there is a way there is a divine order to the universe and if you don't get with it in a sense you are not extinguished by some higher authority you more or less just extinguish yourself Oh, that's an interesting maybe concept. This is too, maybe this is too subtle a point here, but it's like beings who do not accept God's way. God gives them, out of his mercy, he gives them an enormous amount of time to get with the program. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But the universe has a program. The universe, there is a kind of evolution happening, 
And if these beings don't choose to get with it, they, in a sense, just wink out at a certain point. They're not just killed. They just cease to exist. And that's their choice. Okay, so basically they just become basically deleted. Exactly. Okay. Now, what they did, there's a part of God, that we, what they call the supreme being. Let's think of that as the, the, the memory, God's memory, right? In other words, everything that ever happens, now this is hard to get a hold of, but everything that ever is, that ever happened, that is a part of God's perfect memory of whatever, you know. In other words, they, they will continue to exist there, but they will have no personal reality. It's just, in other words, it's just a history of what they did, but they personally no longer, they, their personality just ceases to exist. They have no independent existence anymore. And I guess maybe that was kind of a, a dog leg off of the main course, but I know that the Arantia teachings don't adhere to the idea of this burning eternal hell, and I was kind of drawing it towards this idea of what constitutes redemption, what constitutes eternal life, and what constitutes um, what would effectively be the deletion of beings at every level. Yes, what, what, what constant, uh, in other words, we are endowed with, with a potential for eternal life if we just choose to keep on going, if we choose to keep uh, expanding, we, we ourselves choose to keep evolving. We, we choose to keep experiencing, not only in, in our human life, but in all these stages to come. We willingly go along and we begin to more and more and more understand and incorporate uh, God's way, God's will. It, it's like Thy will, be, Thy will be done. And this is a learning process. This is a, even to a certain amount of trial and error, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And as long as we're willing to do that, as long as we're willing to keep growing, which might mean for a lot of people to me to accept the fact that they they've done terrible things to other beings, like in, in Lucifer's case, Satan's case, that they cause un this un unimaginable pain and suffering by throwing everything into chaos uh, as long as we're willing to keep leaning in that direction as long as they're, 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 God's nature also is one of mercy and as long as we continue to strive at least strive to, to do his will we keep growing because the Rancher book does say that our soul is, our, is a repository of all of our experience and it's a dynamic thing between our personality and our soul. This is a dynamic growth, and if it ceased to keep growing, we would cease to to exist. So that is the condition for eternal life: is that you've got a whole universe to cross, and then you know there's a billion worlds on that inner universe to cross before you get to paradise. And then again, you're only just beginning. So. It's the willingness to, shall we say, keep experience, keep adding to your soul, is the condition for eternal life. It's what we're dealing with here in some ways, and I understand why this book's so big, because of the detail. We're dealing with huge issues, and it's one of the things that I, I really like about the book and about the work that um, the people in, in the Urantia communities are doing, because it forces us to deal with things on a scale that I don't think most of us have dealt with. As we're sitting here talking about this, um, there are times when my mind's boggled by this. And well, it took, it took me a number of years to read the Arantia book, too, because it just, there's hundreds and hundreds of new concepts. But then, Randy, the thing is that they all tie together. No one I've known, some people have their Urantia book, it's like their Bible. They, they, they have it all earmarked and color-coded and 30 little tabs and everything <laughs> else. Mm -hmm. No one has yet found a single internal inconsistency. Well, That's why it, it, yeah. it kind of hits you after a while. It claims to be written by all extraterrestrial beings, in other words, extra human beings. Yes, yes. And so after, I, by the way, this is one of my, the thing I love to play with on the Rancher book is if it's not what it claims to be, who wrote it? In other words, back in the late 1930s, you would have to have a blackboard at least a few hundred feet long, 
and you would have to have a, several hundred people from all these different disciplines, like the theology, uh, a theologian, a geologist, a uh, shall we say the finest writers who would write these 600 pages of Christ's life, you know, expanding on the Bible. You have all these men coming together. We know how well they got along in those days, right? The hard science people with the theologians. They're going to have to have a several hundred foot blackboard to just to outline it and then to start writing it so that there's no internal inconsistencies. So that's my big tease. That's what I love to tease folks with is that if it isn't what it claims to be, how do you explain it? It, it sounds like science fiction, except that it's a physical book I can put in your hand. Now, given the time in which this was basically transmitted and received, um, if we just go back with the comfortable date that I have of somewhere between the 30s and the 40s, yeah. how much of the how much of the scientific principles have since been confirmed? Do we have um, prescience within the text itself that that kind of shows us that yeah, this was projecting ahead of our current state of knowledge at that time certain principles. Uh, yes. Uh, as a matter of fact, there's a website. Let me look my notes here. Uh, it's called um, UB, in your ranch book, capital UB, the news dot com. UB, the news dot com. It's on one of those, when you go to UB websites, it's, it's listed there. This is a friend of mine. He's called Hal uh, uh, Katzen. And he's devoted many, many years of his life. If you go to his website, you'll see several dozen ways in which things which were first mentioned in the Arantia book have since been scientifically proven. One example is uh, the Arantia book calls dark gravity bodies, where the gravity is so intense that light, even light, cannot escape. Of course, we call them now black holes. Uh, a lot of the geology that appears, the continental drifts, I mean, years ago when I was in college, they just started coming out with a theory of continental drift. Right, right, yeah, yeah. That That is something that the Arantia book it spends a whole chapter about talking, well, this part came up and that part went down, and if you want to see the aboriginal rock of the planet, go to the Hudson Bay area. This is the kind of, this yeah, kind of that detail. I'm very familiar with. Right. So that is, that is, there's, if you go to UB the News, he'll give you several dozen ways in which the Ranchi book was very prescient and has been since proven uh, to be correct. In terms of the revelation itself that's, that's been put out in this book, um, how did it, when you initially encountered this, Jerry, from a personal standpoint, what was your own personal background? How, a two-part question. Your right. personal background and how you approached it, and have you watched as other people who have come from different theological perspectives embrace this as well? In other words, how, how do they approach this? Yes, it was just um, back in the early 60s. Um, I, know, I was kind of a, of a bit of a, hip, a bit of a hippie out here in, in San Francisco, uh, chasing the girls and things. It was a, it was a very marvelous time, believe me. <laughs> the 60s in San Francisco was a, a, quite a... Uh, quite a time, and we were all just uh, just kicking around. Uh, I remember re reading a lot of Robert Heinlein, a lot of science fiction. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, uh, I was always interested in, in um, Zen Buddhism because I, I just I was uh, in the Marine Corps in the Far East for a number of years, and I just got out of Vietnam, so I was glad to be back in the states. And all this crazy stuff was happening here in the Bay Area, and we were just reading a lot of uh, almost everything. And so, uh, one time, one of my close friends, I, I felt I got very close with, uh, he just mentioned this, uh, the Arantia book, and a few years later, I saw it at a bookstore, so I just picked it up. My first, I started reading it, and as you know, the first 50 pages are the nature of God, and I, I just set it down for months, I thought it was pure theology. Mm -hmm. And then, for some reason or another, I, I do, opened it up again, and I discovered what I recommend to your listeners, and that is... There's a index in which every every one of these 190 chapters is outlined, and so all of a sudden I was drawn to the scientific stuff myself. Like uh, 
the way planets are formed. Uh, it would say things like uh, there are suns, there are suns in the universe as big as the uh, the orbit of Jupiter. Well, of course, <laughs> that, that we know that now too. So I, I started getting into that, and then the third section of the Arantia book is the history of the planet, starting way back when when our sun came out of a spiral nebula, and. All of a sudden, in 100 million year segments, it gives the way the Earth was formed. And then all of a sudden, here comes beings called life carriers who actually plant life on the planet. And it, it just started hitting me, uh, that, uh, uh, the way everything was tied together. And then also, uh, because I was raised in the Midwest with a bunch of or what we call fundamentalists, right. they just turned me off against Christianity. <laughs> yeah. Then all of a sudden, here's here's 600 pages of of the life of Jesus, and here I was kind of a, a Zen Buddhist, didn't think much of Christianity. All of a sudden, here's a day to day account of Jesus's life, and I'm thinking, wait a minute, where did this <laughs> where did this come from? You know, and so all of a sudden, it presented Jesus in a way that is so comprehensive, and uh, just his character and his personality comes through. So enormously, but also not only the person Jesus, and I know this is a big theological thing, not only his human nature, but his divine nature. Because it says right in the Urantia book that when Jesus walked into the Jordan that day, you know, to be uh, baptized by his cousin John, that was his last purely human act. In other words, as he was baptized, he all of a sudden regained his full memory that he was this 400 billion year old creator son of God. <laughs> so yeah, those, yeah. Things, those things really hit you, you know? And, and I tell you, there's so many times in your ranch book, you just get tears coming out of your eyes, you're, you're breaking up laughing, you know? Well, that actually is the, the in, in, in the Gospels, it, it is, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Exactly. And um, theologically, uh, that's not in conflict with me because to me that is the impartation of the knowing of his part in the Godhead. Exactly. Do you think about it? It says he, he went off by himself for a while. Yeah. And and he, he just walked off, and, and shortly after he walked off, just he, in other words, he's still a human being. As, as I, uh, by the way, I, I transmitted a wonderful uh, lesson of Michael talking about this time. He said that. He, He's still a human being. He can still feel the dust between his toes. He still had his whole human life. And all of a sudden, he discovers he's a creator, son of God. He went off for 40 days just to decide what to do. And shortly thereafter, appeared suddenly appeared next to him, Gabriel, his, his oldest son, whom he hadn't seen you know, ever since he'd been a human being. And Gabriel told him that, Jesus, Michael, you can now, you fulfilled your mission. You can leave at any time. In other words, you could leave the planet. You have fulfilled your mission of having a human life. And so Michael went off to decide, Jesus went off to decide what to do. And as we know, he chose then to, he, uh, he wasn't wrestling with Satan or Lucifer or anything. He was just choosing what to do, deciding what to do with the rest of his human life and deciding to stay around and start this whole correcting time here on the earth. But also, Randy, you have to keep in mind that the whole local universe of nearly four million planets, they were observing this whole thing. There's a thing called universal reflectivity by which all all of the more advanced planets of our local universe were observing his entire life. So what he was doing was not only for us on our on this one lowly little planet, it was teaching in a sense his whole entire local universe of what it was to be a human being and, and the son of God. So this was a uniquely Urantian event, the incarnation of Michael into the human form to experience life basically from ground zero. This was a requirement that his father, God, put upon him. In other words, he had to... By the way, it was, it was the seventh bestowal, the six other ten. In other words, every creator son of God is required to live a life of his subordinate beings, his own sons and daughters. And so 
Michael was a Melchizedek for a while. He was an archangel for a while, so forth. And so the <laughs> the last last thing was was for him to have a human life. And at the moment of his baptism, he had fulfilled all his requirements. And there was he actually could have just left at that moment. And his whole status changed. He became a master creator son. And in other words, his whole status actually changed because of his human life here. And so that's, there's so many things that are, are tied up in that. But yes, he's required by God to have a human life, which he did. Interesting stuff. So he graduated. You might say by having a human life. <laughs> Michael graduated, and his whole... Or, uh, his whole being actually changed. He became a master son of of, of God, a creator son, and uh, now there won't be there, in this entire local universe. There will be no more rebellions. And there was a whole local universe being his creation. He is he and Mother Spirit's creation. The whole nature of everything changed. In other words, he also showed the way by which a human being can achieve a level of deity, even while in this first life of ours. So it was, it was it was showing God to us and it's also showing to God what a human being is capable of. Work both ways. One final question. We're coming up on the hour break. We're going to take maybe a seven or eight minute break, Jerry. Uh, um, the crucifixion was not, from the Arantia point of view, the blood atonement for the sins of men. Is that correct? Yes. That uh, there, there is no atonement. They, 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 they uh, take issue with the whole atonement doctrine because God is not some kind of wrathful deity that needs to be appeased in any way, shape, or form. Yes, and that's that. Actually, I struggled with that for years, and it goes back even into the Old Testament with the slaughtering of animals and the blood sacrifices, which kind of paralleled. The human sacrifices that were at least portrayed in history as being part of the um, paganistic rituals of outside civilizations. And well, is it mentioned that uh, Jesus himself, um, he, even though he's a creator son of God, I mean, it's ironic because in one way he was the Messiah. He could have waved his hand and wiped out the Roman Empire. Right, yeah, exactly. <laughs> And so he had this power. At the same time, he had such a tender heart that, in the Bible, talks about that time he he went into the temple and just released all the animals because he just couldn't stand this animal sacrifice. Where, I guess, if you're rich, you could buy a cow to be sacrificed. If you're poor, maybe ten people could go together and buy a pigeon to be sacrificed. He turned all the animals loose, and then he created such a riot. He himself didn't, but all the other people rioted and threw out you know all the money changers. They just had a big free for all and then got this big riot going so he's also at the same time he's a creator son of god he's also this very tender-hearted kind of being who couldn't stand this torture of these animals has michael spoken about what happened after that the what, what's called the resurrection uh not through me uh he, his whole orientation to me is his is, is a, a kind of different but in the ranching book it talks about, oh, I forget exactly, I think it was 20 or 30 some ways in which he appeared to his disciples and then to other people. And one of the ones, I don't think it's in the Bible, but one time all his followers come back out of Jerusalem, they're just totally dejected. I mean, they're, they're, they're beloved. I mean, this person they loved so dearly was, was crucified. And all of a sudden, they noticed someone uh, on the sea. They were going back down to you know, this kind of their old haunts around the Sea of Galilee. They noticed someone kind of sitting by a fire. And he walked over, and here was Jesus. Mm -hmm. and, and so he, <laughs> the Arantian book has this the way he just talked to them all in and, and, and a very informal kind of way. Uh, just very, very touching. With that, we're going to take a break, and uh, we'll play some music for the folks on the stream. Jerry, if you want to also take a break at this point, we'll readjourn in about five minutes. So this has been the first hour of Off Planet Radio Live. My guest tonight is Jerry Lane, and we're talking about the book, The Adventure of Being Human, Lessons on Soulful Living from the Heart of the Urantia Revelation. Jerry, where do people find this book? Uh... 
they can go to, uh, first of all, Amazon.com and uh, just The Adventure of Being Human. It's right there. And uh, also, if they want to go to our website, evolving-souls.org, evolving souls with a dash in the middle, evolvingsouls.org, they can also order it from there. Excellent. We'll take a break, and we'll be back in about five to seven minutes. This is Off Planet Radio. We will be right back. <laughs> 